hello guys so today we'll continue our class regarding the morphology of cephalopods now firstly we found in some cephalopods that the apertural portion of some cephalopod shells or some cephalopod fossils they are slightly modified and they show that may occur in the lateral side or that may occur in the ventral side also now this extension may be large they can be small in size but the apertural smoothness is modified and these kinds of extension in the apertural side is observed now when these kinds of extension are found to occur in the lateral side or in the flanks of the hole it is known as lapid or it is called lapid and when these kinds of extension found in the ventral side this is known as rostrum now the proper function of these kinds of features are unknown properly to the scientist but it is thought that these structures are somewhat related to sexual dimorphism that is on the basis of these structures we can identify the two sexual counterparts of the cephalopod cells so coming to sexual dimorphism the term sexual dimorphism means that the cephalopod cells have two two distinct morphs that means two distinct morphological uh, assemblages shown in terms of their sexual counterparts that means the two sexual uh, groups that means male and female counterparts of cephalopods they can be distinctly separated on the basis of morphological characters and they can be grouped into groups so that is why it is known as sexual dimorphism but before going to comment anything on sexual dimorphism one should be very much concerned that whether that particular cephalopod shell or whether that particular cephalopod fossil is actually representing a fully grown specimen or uh, that means the specimen is of a adult because in the present day also what we found in the organic worlds that many of the uh, features many of the morphological characters are not well developed or are not uh, came into the scenario until the organism reaches its mature stage or reaches its adult stage so likewise it is also found in cephalopods that the characters that the morphological features are only fully found or only fully developed in the fully grown adult specimens so before going to comment or before going to separate the two sexual counterparts of the cephalopods we have to identify whether the cephalopod is a adult individual or not now if the cephalopod shells are of in the adult stage then they show these kinds of distinct size variations here you can see one is far far smaller than the other the smaller one is known as microconch and the larger one is known as macroconch now this terminology microconch and macroconch it was given depending on its size and it is commonly found that the macroconchs are almost two to four times larger in size compared to microconchs but a typical feature by which we can separate the microconchs from the macroconchs is the presence of lapid or rostrum 
the lapate or rostrum is only found in the microcons and it is commonly believed that the microcons they are the male counterparts of the cephalopods whereas the macrocons they are the female counterparts within the cephalopods now again it is most commonly found in the nature uh, in most of the organisms of nature that due to the requirement of higher metabolic uh, energy uh, due to the uh, work done or due to different kinds of uh, biological work done by the female counterparts of any population of any organism the female counterparts are generally larger in size compared to the male counterparts uh, but in human world this law is not followed in human world generally males are larger in size but apart from human in most of the cases of the organic world females are larger than the uh, males so likewise in cephalopod also it was thought that these large size specimens that is these macrocons they are the female counterparts whereas the microconch which are two to four times smaller than the macrocons they are the male counterparts now the, this picture was taken from the famous book that is the cover page of the famous book principles of paleontology written by rob and stanley now comment more on the dimorphism as i already told we have to identify uh, the adult stage of cephalopods so there are certain characters certain properties by which we can uh, say whether the cephalopod is in its adult stage or not the first property is the increased density of septa it means that whenever the cephalopod reaches its adult stage that is whenever the cephalopod is fully grown the distance between two individual septum is decreasing in the adult stage so within a given uh, length of hole suppose we are considering a complete 360 degree rotation of hole or say for example in the last portion the last 90 degree portion of the hole the number of septum that is the countings of septa that shows higher numbers compared to the previous portion if the specimen is of a adult so in the adult stage the number of septa are more closely spaced that indicates that density is also higher in the adult stage and what we most commonly found in the fossil record is the uh, fossils of cephalopod so in those cases the presence of septum is represented by sutures so in fossil cephalopods adult stage is identified by the increased density of sutures in the last portions in the last uh, few uh, uh, in the last uh, part of the cephalopod shells and that represent the adult stage at this uh, increased density of sector or suture is mainly occurred because after reaching the adult stage the growth rate of cephalopods are decreasing so lesser amount of new shell material is added in the growing direction but the creation of septum is occurring in its fixed interval so with lesser forward movement of the shell because of the diminishing growth rate but as the rate of creation of septum becomes constant so that is why we found in very low distance or in a very uh, low portion 
of the cephalopod shell we found increased number of septum or increased number of suture so that indicates increased density and that particularly occur in the adult stage secondly the simplification of suture that means all the curvatures of the flutings found within the uh, saddle and low portions of the uh, suture or in the septum they becomes more simple and particularly the longer lobes are shortened and simplified so that means the uh, septal fluting the curvature of lobes the depth of the lobes they becomes more opened up more simple thirdly the presence of lapate or rostrum which is particularly found in the microcongs of uh, cephalopods fourthly in the adult stage the sculptures that is the ornamentation found in the external shell surface they are going to be distinctly changed that means either the ornamentation vanish completely obsolete or they become more densely spaced they become more denser increase in density so uh, it may happen that the say for example that the cords bully and clavy uh, or tubercles what is present in the earlier ontogenical stages of the cephalopod shell they may be reduced in size or they may be completely uh, vanished from the cephalopod shells or their density may be increased that may happen in case of radial ribbings also so whatever may be thing either the uh, the ornamentation uh, which is present in the earlier ontogeny they may be vanished or they may be change their relative strength or they may be change in their distance between two successive uh, ornamentations so whatever may occur we must found a distinct change in ornamentation pattern in the adult stage and lastly there is uncoiling of shell is also found in the adult stage so the cephalopod shells is the coiling of the cephalopod shells is uh, becomes more open it uh, try to follow to detached from its earlier coiled portions so whenever these kinds of uncoiling is found we may also say that the cephalopod shell or the cephalopod fossil reaches its adult stage now it is not necessary to present all these features a cephalopod shell or cephalopod fossil may show one of the one of these features or more than one of these features so on the basis of those features which are present in the cephalopod shells or cephalopod fossils any one among these two or more than one of these uh, features if found in the cephalopod shells or cephalopod fossils we can comment on their adult stage that means we can identify them as whether they are adult or not now another interesting thing is that when we are concerned about the dimorphism that is when we are commenting on the two different sexual counterparts of the same species of cephalopod we have to look after their earlier ontogenies because in the adult stage as we see in the previous uh, slides that in the adult stage the macrocongs and microcongs they are distinctly different they are distinctly different in size and other morphological characters so we have to particularly look on the 
juvenile stages when they show identical features that is why the early juvenile stages are very important to comment whether these two distinct sized cephalopod shells or two distinct sized variants are representing the same species and they are sexually different from one another so the earlier ontogenital stages is very important to comment on sexual dimorphism secondly the if these organisms are the macrocongs and microcongs are of the same species then they should occur side by side that is they should be found within the same stratigraphic horizon uh, it is not possible to occur them the two different sexual counterparts to occur them in two different stratigraphic horizons in two different time intervals because for reproduction process the two different biologically different sexual counterparts they have to occur side by side so it is likely to be found them in the stratigraphic record within the same strata now if the after the date the macrocong and microcong are found within the same stratigraphic horizon and it is commonly expected that a fixed ratio fixed sexual ratio that is the male is to female counterpart ratio that should be maintained within the stratigraphic horizon most commonly it is expected that uh, one is to one sexual ratio should be maintained but whatever may be the ratio uh, that should be maintained within the stratigraphic horizon in all places and uh, that numerical ratio of those two supposed uh, sex sex of microcongs and macrocongs they are comparable to the observed living forms that is what is we found the sexual ratio in the present day cephalopods more or less same ratio must be present in the cephalopods of that ancient time also another very important thing is here as we came to know that the macrocong and microcong are very distinctly different in size so being a paleontologist we first segregate or we first differentiate the fossil species into different groups on the basis of their morphological characters so in most cases it was happened that on the basis of their distinctly different size they are grouped into two different species now after the incorporation of sexual dimorphism into the scientific literatures or this kinds of thinking when came into the uh, scenario then people try to look after the sexual counterparts or the sexual variants within the cephalopods so then they have to look different larger size cephalopod cells and different smaller size cephalopod cells previously described as different species now that becomes a jigsaw puzzle so whose whose larger matches with which smaller specimen and they should be clubbed in a uh, or they should represent a single species so for that it is believed that whenever a species goes through some kinds of changing that means whenever a species um, incorporate some adaptation through time through sur for survival that means it is going for um, through some evolutionary change then the rate of this evolutionary change or the trend of this evolutionary change should be showing in a similar fashion in both microconk and macrocong 
if they at all belong to the same species because it is not the individual it is not a particular sexual group who is showing or who is incorporating some uh, evolutionary changes but instead the unit which shows evolutionary changes is the species so it is the species which makes some adaptation to sustain the long run in the evolutionary landscape so in a cephalopod species if the macroconch and the microconch they belongs to the same species then they also show same kinds of evolutionary change that is they also show same kinds of morphological changes through time so for that different size variations and their morphological changes now here you can see an example here one and two is represented by two different time intervals in the x-axis in all these uh, binary plots and in the y-axis people's plot different morphological characters say for this for this case it is the diameter that is capital d now the diameter of microconch and macroconch are plotted against time and it was seen that they show more or less a parallel nature more or less a increasing trend similarly in the second case umbilical diameter by diameter this ratio umbilical diameter and diameter ratio is plotted against time and again the microconch and macroconch showing increasing trend and parallel nature of increasing of this ratio apertural height and apertural width ratio this also showing increasing trend both in macroconch and microconch number of primary ribs in a complete 360 degree rotation again the macroconch and microconch showing parallel nature of development and in this time this show they show decreasing in number number of secondary ribs ribs again they are decreasing both in macroconch and microconch and they are decreasing in the same rate and they show the same trend so you can see in this case in this particular study that is done on the hubertoceras that is the genus one genus of ammonoids where the macroconch and microconch which was previously grouped in two different species when they are studied in terms of different morphologies with time those two species are found that they show same evolutionary trend of changing morphological characters through time that means these are the representative of a single species so whenever we try to depict sexual dimorphism keep in mind that if they are originally representative of the two different sexual counterparts of the same species then with time they must show same evolutionary changes so this is the concept of sexual dimorphism and these kinds of sexual relationship with morphology and by observing different morphological characters the uh, differentiation of different sexual counterparts into two groups is very well studied nowadays in cephalopods and on the basis of this study among mollusks it is the cephalopods who can be uh, easily separated or easily distinguished into two different sexual counterparts for rest of the other mollusk and groups for bivalves and gastropods it is little bit 
difficult because the morphological characters in those sexual counterparts are not fully um, understand till date clearly in the two different sexual counterparts but in case of cephalopods this is very well established and uh, nowadays people are looking all the cephalopods whenever they found in the fossil record uh, from the angle of sexual dimorphism so many of the previously described species uh, which are separated on the basis of their morphological characters particularly on the basis of their size uh, they are now clubbed they are now grouped within a single species and uh, position them in microconch and microconch of the same species now coming to the another group of cephalopods that is the third subclass of cephalopods within our syllabus that is the subclass coleoidea and within coleoidea we will study the group belemnite belemnites are one cephalopod group of organisms which are very common and abundantly found in the mesozoic rocks particularly in the jurassic and cretaceous uh, sedimentary rocks uh, and these organisms this group of organisms along with the uh, ammonoids they completely extinct at the kt boundary now coming to the morphology of belemnites the belemnite shell has the posterior most part is known as the rostrum or guard the middle part is known as phragmocone and the front most part is known as proostacum one interesting thing which differentiate belemnites from the previously studied cephalopods is that in the previously studied cephalopod groups that is in the nautiloids or ammonoids the hard part or the shell is external but in case of belemnites here the hard part is completely internal so in this case the belemnite hard part is not used for a protection cover now as i already told the posterior most portion which is the largest part of belemnite is known as rostrum or guard and this rostrum or guard is made up of radially arranged calcite crystals from a point so all the calcite crystals are diverged or radiated from a common point and it is commonly found that the point from where the calcite crystals radiate out that point occurs slightly more towards the ventral side so on the basis of this point from which the calcite crystals are radiated out uh, its closeness to the side we can say which side is ventral side and which side is dorsal, uh, dorsal side as you can see in this picture the point is more towards this direction so this will be the ventral side and this side is the dorsal side now apart from this radial crystals in the cross section of belemnite guards we can also see some concentric structures or concentric rings these are the growth rings of belemnite guard or belemnite rostrum belemnite guard or this rostrum is parallel sided and it tapers posteriorly to a point which looks this rostrum a shape like a bullet in the anterior most portion of the rostrum there is a conical cavity or conical hollow that is known as alveolus and within this alveolus the phragmocone rest that is this phragmocone this white colored portion this portion fits exactly 
within this alveolus. The phagmocone is also a conical, thin walled aragonetic structures which is projected outside from the alveolus. And you can see the successive uh, chambers within the phragmocones. These are the earlier chambers, earlier cameries of the uh, belemnites. And it also st started with the protoconch and gradually as we move more towards anterior direction, we get more and more younger chambers. And the extreme anterior portion lies the last body chamber from which the soft part emerges and it is also found that in the extreme anterior part particularly in the dorsal part dorsal plate like projection was found which is known as pro ostracum this plate like flat projected portion from the phragmocone is known as proostracum and it is thought that below this proostracum all the soft masses like the gills beak eye siphons all the visceral masses occurs below this uh, so below this proostracum so this proostracum is basically acts as a protection cover of this head region of the belemnite belemnite which looks at all different from the typical uh, other cephalopods from the nautiloids or ammonoids but these belemnites instead of coiled they are straight they are horizontal but how we know that these are these belongs to the cephalopod group cephalopod uh, class that can be identified by observing the phragmocone part. In the phragmocone part, we can see that there are numerous chambers which are separated by the septum. That means the uh, entire phragmocone is septate. And these septa, they are concave anteriorly. If we look at the curvature of this septa, concave in this direction. So this indicates that the curvature of the septa is concave anteriorly. Also, it is found that all these chambers are connected by a tube like feature which is known as siphuncle, and this siphuncle occurs in the ventral side or more towards the ventral margin. So, like the other cephalopods like the nautiloids and um, ammonoids although they are distinctly different in uh, shape but they have some common characters that mean that is they are um, they are chambers which is divided into different segments by numerous septa and the occurrence of siphuncle which connected all the chambers these features confirms that the belemnites are also a subclass or also a group of cephalopoda. As I already told that the hard part of belemnite is completely internal. So you can see that the, all these hard parts, the rostrum or the phragmocone or the proostracum, they are covered with a thin skin, thin soft mass that is a skin like coating and below the proostracum here lies the head position and uh, head and all the visceral masses. Now if you look at the structure of belemnites you can see that they are occur in a horizontal fashion. So to maintain the balance of the forward muscles you can see all the organs are occur particularly in the anterior part so to maintain the balance and to maintain this horizontal position within the water column belemnites have required a 
uh, hard counterbalance in against these uh, anterior soft masses so it is the rostrum which maintain the balance for these anteriorly occurring all the soft mass and for that the belemnites maintain a horizontal position within the water column when you look at the fossil mostly what we get in the fossil record is the rostrum part or the guard of belemnite most commonly the proostracum and alveolus these parts are broken out and destroyed during fossilization so only thing only preserved part which is most commonly found that is the ostracum and or rostrum and often or very less commonly the alveolus portion is found but phragmocone preservation of phragmocone and proostracum is very 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 rare it is most commonly found or often found in the rock record that mass accumulation of belemnites guards within a uh, stratigraphic horizon that is a huge number of belemnite guards are found within a stratigraphic horizon now these kinds of mass accumulation of belemnite guards within a stratigraphic horizon may be represent a mass mortality after spawning Uh, in this picture you can also see that here about 250 numbers of belemnite guards or belemnite rostrum are found inside the stomach of a 180 million year old shark so this shark take many belemnites as its meal it is easy to capture the belemnites for the shark so it takes about 250 like 250 numbers of belemnites and it digests all the soft mass but the hard part that is the rostrum part that cannot be digested by the shark so probably this rostrum is the cause of the death of this shark and because they are found they are occurring in the stomach so they are unusually preserved and found accumulated in this small area so probably this was the last meal of the shark before its death so it is a kind of exceptional occurrence exceptional concentration of belemnite guards which occur by due to some biological cause thank you that's all for the cephalopod which is in your undergrad syllabus hope this will help you to understand the cephalopod morphologies and different functions thank you